Good morning from Toronto, Canada, and a very good afternoon and evening to everyone who has joined us on Zoom and Facebook Live from across the world. A very warm welcome to our amazing panelists to Green Hope's webinar on Building Back Better Through a Culture of Peace. My name is Kekisha. I am the founder president of Green Hope Foundation, and I will be your moderator for this webinar. We stand at a critical moment in Earth's history, a time when humanity must choose its future. This is the opening phrase of the Earth Charter that was adopted at the onset of the new millennium in the year 2000. And never before has this phrase been so relevant as it is today. And humanity is struggling to survive its greatest challenge that has befallen us without any warning, manifesting itself in the form of a virus, an entity that is so small and invisible to the naked eye, but so mighty that it has literally shut down the entire world, locking us in our homes and changing forever the way we go about our lives. And this is indeed a moment of reckoning for us, but at the same time, despite all of the challenges the world has endured, we have also been given a unique opportunity of resetting the way we go about our lives, about the choices that we make and the decisions we take. And this is truly the opportunity of a lifetime and it would be criminal to squander it and revert to the old ways of doing things. Last week, in its statement during the 75th UN General Assembly, Costa Rica reminded us that our resources and priorities must focus on the ambitious and comprehensive human development program ever designed, Agenda 2030 and the SDGs, and yet global military spending continues to rise and has reached the absurd figure of $1.9 trillion in 2019. And how can nations spend $1.9 trillion on arms when we have 165 million children who don't go to school, and now even more during the pandemic? And if only nations had used a portion of that $1.9 trillion last year to ramp up our infrastructure, build better healthcare systems, reduce poverty and inequality, we would not have been in the precarious situation that we find ourselves in today. And even though hindsight is always 2020, it's imperative that we learn from it. And there is no room in this new normal for this profligacy. It has to stop. And we need every dollar to be meaningfully invested to ensure that it empowers the farthest person first. Now, when human suffering is at its zenith, we need more than ever before to adopt a culture of peace and rebuild a world based on the principles of justice, of harmony, and of equality. So today, we are truly honored to have with us a multidisciplinary panel of experts who are icons and leaders globally. And it'll be a privilege for us to listen to their thoughts on the steps we need to take, the pitfalls to avoid, the milestones that we must set, and why a culture of peace is so important in this evolution so that we can actually come out of this crisis more resilient. So on that note, I would like to invite our first speaker, Madam Audrey Kitagawa, Chair of the Parliament of the World's Religions. Madam Kitagawa, you have the floor. Well, thank you so much, Kekashan, for this invitation to share about the culture of peace and building back better. I mean, I really feel privileged to be with such experienced and respected peace builders who have spent most of their lives helping to make this world a more peaceful as well as safe and secure place to live. And in the present context of our environment, which you've mentioned, with so much suffering going on due to the global pandemic, 
with those who are fighting for their health or the health of their loved ones, our economy under siege, the environment weighing in with wildfires, hurricanes, and a host of other disasters due to climate change, which scientists warned us about years ago. We are facing unprecedented multiple and cascading crises, which are singularly and collectively causing great stress. And the consequences of these crises have affected more profoundly and critically the infirm, marginalized, and most vulnerable segments of our population. And in honoring this year's International Day of Peace and how we can build back better through a culture of peace, more comprehensive educational, cultural, social, and civic action, the deep question arises. What are the core issues that need to be addressed as part of this social and civic action? And I feel that first we must recognize that a culture of peace will have the maximum amount of success if every person in society is innately peaceful within. To achieve that state does require some form of spiritual discipline and practice daily to quiet the mind and to find inner serenity whether through meditation, prayer, or some remembrance of the divine in our daily lives. In so many ways, this spiritual discipline and practice is essential for every person to undertake, but recognizably, it is difficult to do or adhere to if you are going hungry, you have no place to live, or are displaced due, an, due to a natural disaster or can't get appropriate medical treatment because of the chaos created by the overwhelm of a pandemic that has taxed the first responders and healthcare providers. We therefore have to be prepared that when we start experiencing failed states or failed comprehensive coherent state action to address these major problems, we as members of civil society have to be ready to step up to fill the void. More and more, we may see situations of governments being unable to address the needs of a citizenry. And we as citizens should be prepared ourselves to be the ones to address those needs. Since we live in communities, we are best positioned to know the people in our respective communities and know where the greatest needs exist. This is a great gift, which faith-based organizations bring, since they have huge reach into their respective communities, and they are well positioned to be on the ground first responders. Civil society actors, therefore, need to be proactive and think about creating rapid response teams who can provide food, shelter, water, and other necessities to help those in need. Having this kind of coordinated response should certainly be done on a national as well as global level. But in light of states' failures to do so, every citizen on the ground has to create coalitions to help those in their respective communities. And when there is no coordinated response, you may have a lot of people of goodwill sending in supplies and goods that do not address what the communities need. So this coordinated response assumes that mechanisms will also be developed that can accelerate the smooth distribution of aid during these crises. And with improved technology, coordinated data collection, sharing, and transfer around the world can help us better coordinate our local and global responses. In stepping forward to help our neighbor, whether near or far, we are really sharing our hearts of caring and kindness with each other. This, of course, represents the best of what the sacred teachings and texts of all religious traditions teach. And the question arises, why is dialogue so critical in this current context? And I would say that dialogue is about an issue or a range of issues and builds towards addressing and finding a mutual positive outcome for the issues. When we are faced with a particular crisis or any number of crises, engaging in dialogue about the situation and building towards a solution or solutions is absolutely essential. It also commences a consultative process that engages others who can provide valuable insights and potential approaches and solutions. And, you know, frankly, there is no one person, group, or government that can deal with the mul multiple challenges alone, and it will take collective effort. And the principles of dialogue that I wanted to share with you very briefly that were set forth by the Institute of Economical Studies set forth the principles as follows. That the essential purpose of dialogue is to learn 
which entails a willingness to change. At the very least, to learn that one's dialogue partner views the world differently to, it is to effect a change in and of itself. And dialogue, of course, must be a two-sided project and depending on how many participants you have. And it is imperative that each participant comes to the dialogue with complete honesty and sincerity. So one must compare only his or her ideals with their partner's ideals and his or her practices with the partner's practices. So each participant needs to describe her and himself as well in a very authentic way. So participants must, must not come in the dialogue with any preconceptions as to where the points of disagreements lie. But dialogue can take place only between equals, which means that partners learn from each other and do not merely seek to teach one another. So dialogue can take place on the basis of mutual trust because it is persons and not entire communities that enter into dialogue. And it is essential for personal trust to be established. To encourage this is important that less controversial matters be discussed before dealing with more controversial ones. And participants in dialogues should have a healthy level of criticism toward their own selves or their own traditions. And this is a constructive criticism process. And the primary purpose of dialogue is to learn. So to understand another entails a willingness to step into the worldview of the other. And why is this ability to dialogue so important? It is important because it assumes that we are willing to listen. You know, God gave us two ears and one mouth, so we should really listen twice as much as we speak. And further, it assumes that one is in a state of receptivity to learn about the other and thereby grow from the interaction. So this does require some modicum of humility that we don't you know, walk in with an attitude that we have all the answers. And humility is a very important character trait to have. It cuts arrogance, a sense of elitism, and being better than another, which can be immediately off-putting and erode trust right off the bat. And so how should the program of action on a culture of peace be adapted to make it relevant to this new normal that we're kind of getting adapted to. Well, I'd like to call your attention to in, uh, in 2000, a manifesto was drafted by a group of uh, Nobel Peace Laureates for a culture of peace and nonviolence to translate the resolutions of the United Nations on the culture of peace and nonviolence into everyday language addressed to all people. And the manifesto asked individuals to pledge in my daily life, in my family, my work, my community, country, and region to do the following. And I think it's very worthwhile to articulate what those are. Respect the life and dignity of each human being without discrimination or prejudice. Practice active nonviolence, rejecting violence in all its forms, physical, sexual, psychological, economic, and social, in particular towards the most deprived and vulnerable, such as children and adolescents. Share my time and material resources in a spirit of generosity to put an end to exclusion, injustice, and political and economic oppression, and to defend freedom of expression and cultural diversity giving preference always to dialogue and listening without engaging in fanaticism, defamation, and the rejection of others. To promote consumer behavior that is responsible and development practices that respect all forms of life and preserve the balance of nature on the uh, planet and to contribute to the development of my community with a full participation of women and respect for democratic principles in order to create together new forms of solidarity. Now, my recommendation would be to have everyone apply these values and principles into their lives as daily practice as the Nobel Peace Laureates intended it be done. And we would all be on our way to building back better through a culture of peace. So thank you so very much. Thank you so much, Madam Kiragawa. You mentioned so many important points. The first one being that we as citizens need to take action to help those in need and having a coordinated response at the local, regional, national and global uh, level that is so critical to ensure that 
aid truly reaches the people who need it the most. And thank you for also highlighting the importance of faith-based organizations and of course, about emphasizing the importance of dialogue where we listen to one, other, one another, establish a level of personal trust, healthy level of criticism, and of course, having humility so that we can all learn from one another. And as you said, step into one another's worldview. And of course, that would help us to uh, adopt culture of peace as a way of life and thereby build back better. So thank you once again for your remarks. I will now move on to our next panelist, whom I'd like to invite to take the floor, Dr. Lasina Zerbo, Executive Secretary of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization. Dr. Zerbo, you have the floor. Uh, you're on mute. Yeah, done. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Kikashan. Uh, first, let me say how uh, it's a pleasure for me to be on this uh, virtual floor uh, with uh, so many talented people in this field. I will just uh, remember what Ms. Kitagawa said just now, that uh, God gave us two years and one month for us to listen twice as much as we talk. That's a good thing. And uh, thank you for uh, reminding all of us of this uh, uh, way of looking at things. And then we'll try and talk uh, less and then listen to each other more and to people who are our audience today. So we have a good range of speakers, uh, each one uh, having its viewpoint on building a culture of peace in the wake of COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm particularly pleased that this webinar brought representative of the faith communities uh, together with uh, those like me who are working more on the policy side of uh, peace building. The world's religion are united in the wish for peace. And I salute each and every opportunity to bring their perspective to be on issue such as disarmament which are all too often framed as matters of hard security only. At the outset, uh, let me express my sincere admiration for the work of the Green Hope Foundation, especially Kikachan. Uh, she impressed me last time we share a panel, and I think she's uh, showing that youth and uh, children have a voice that needs to be heard. And Kikashan has been uh, working on issues such as climate justice, peace, development, gender equality, and social justice since she was 12 years old. What an inspiration she is to all of us. And Kikashan, thank you so much for doing what you do, and then I uh, sincerely appreciate this. So this is basically people like you, Kikashan, who have led me as executive secretary of the CTBT to value the role of young people. And I set up what you all know now, uh, the CTBT Youth Group, which is now getting close to a thousand people. Its members are playing a leading role in advocating for the world without nuclear tests and in amplifying the linkages between a test ban and peace and security and development. Like you, Kikeshan, you all are an inspiration for us to do better. Today, we are asked to consider how we can build back better from the current pandemic through a culture of peace. We must acknowledge, of course, that we are not yet in the post-COVID phase. For those of us in European countries, the initial, when I say in European countries, that's where I live, but I'm from Burkina Faso, as you know, and uh, researchers are trying to find out why all the prediction that uh, the pandemic will be so deadly in Africa, that this is not the case. But this is something that can be discussed much later. But in European country, uh, the initial growth of cases slowed following lockdown and other government restrictions, and a type of normality seemed to return. Now, however, we are faced with the new rise and a recognition that the acute phase of the pandemic may be with us for some time. All the same, it is right and proper 
to think about what comes next. In the public health sphere alone, there will be certainly be a lot to learn from once this COVID-19 crisis is behind us. I hope that this learning will focus on how best to leverage the work of scientists operating in public health, epidemiology, and other fields in a way that allows for efficient prevention and response for all countries and communities. In other words, more cooperation in the face of shared threats. It will come as no surprise, therefore, to hear that, and I hope, the same holds for nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament, which are so important to peace in the long term. There's been a lot of talk about countries not working together and about supposed failing in science, but I believe building back better means a more, mean a more scientific approach to policy making within and between countries. If we are to prevent and adequately respond to similar events in future, we need more scientific cooperation, more science diplomacy than ever before. And we also need a greater public understanding of science. Despite the global uncertainty, it is my hope that COVID-19 becomes a watershed moment for science diplomacy. The pandemics, climate change, hunger, arms control, and peace building. All of these are problems that reach across boundaries and require science-based shared responses. At the CTBTO, we've always seen science as essential to achieving our goal of ending nuclear tests forever. We operate a state-of-art international monitoring system, which ensures that no nuclear explosion can go undetected and scientists use its data for all kinds of other contributions to a better world. From monitoring the effect of climate change to tsunami warning. And this is where we need young people because they have to go beyond what we do on a daily basis to understand how this data can be used for many other things. So as we emerge from the shadow of COVID possibly next year, will also reach the 25th anniversary of the opening of signature of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty in 1996. In many senses, humanity finds itself at a crossroads as we approach 2021. Will it be the year when countries turn inward and cease collaborating? Or will it be the year when we all work together to build a culture of peace? Rather than backing away from cooperation and co collaboration, we must grasp the post-COVID opportunity to strengthen the organizations, the institutions, and legal instruments that provide peace. At the CTBT, it is certainly important part of this, and that's the work we try to do. We can accomplish this by embracing the creativity and innovation of people like you, the Kesho and movement like the Green Hope Foundation and the CTBT Youth Group and many youth group initiatives around the world. We need your spirit and we need your tenacity as the next generation of global leaders. Our future will be determined by the decision we make now for this year's International Day for Peace. Let us all commit to strengthening the culture of peace through bringing for instance, for me, and with no surprise, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty into force. Through working together on scientific solutions to shared problems, and through leaving no one behind. I look forward to hearing the rest of the discussion and to responding to any question. And forgive me to, for being focused on the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. I've had what we call in French, in deformation professionnelle. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Zervan. I'm so glad you talked to us about the very important work that the CTBT is doing and how important it is for it to come into force now more than ever before. And thank you for also highlighting the crucial role of children and youth in peace and disarmament and in building back better. And you're right, the pandemic is not yet over. We are seeing a second wave, but it is really important for us 
as we emerge into the new normal to have more scientific cooperation, public awareness of this, multilateralism, and not just for building that better and better healthcare systems, but of course, the said for the nuclear non-proliferation. And these are problems that do not have any boundaries, of course, so we need to have solutions that are similarly cross-cutting. So I thank you once again for being here today. I would now like to invite our next panelist, Dr. Mila Popovich, Head of Research and Development, Global Leadership in the 21st Century by UNOG and the WAAS. Dr. Popovich, you have the floor. Thank you so much. What a joy and honor to be here with all of you. And first and foremost, thank you, Kehkashan, for inviting me and gathering us. Um, again, in the words of Dr. Zerbo, I want to acknowledge youth leadership at the time where we're feeling or seeing and witnessing the crisis of conventional leadership for sure. Uh, we are not lacking leadership. It is there and it is emerging uh, from spaces, a vibrant social spaces that have been activated. And I want to honor your leadership as well as the, what you have built already better through Green Hope Foundation. So I really appreciate that. And it is wonderful to be here at a range of capacities that we are bringing and range of legacies already by some of the wonderful panelists today, um, as well as new models of leadership that we are putting forth through um, a transdisciplinary approach, meaning that we're combining um, powers of different domains, of different disciplines, different uh, human activities and knowledge sources in order to come forward in a transdisciplinary way to generate solutions from the collective intelligence that we convene this way. So the new leadership is going to definitely be focused on new ways of connecting knowledge and convening uh, forces and resources, uh, new ways of synthesizing knowledge, which we do not lack. <laughs> uh, we don't lack knowledge. We're experiencing lack of knowledge where there is a lack of collaboration or loss of collaboration. So these new ways in leadership and new models of leadership where we can synthesize our knowledge and synergize our action is going to be the double bind through which we are going to be able to transition forward into the new paradigm of human development. And one of those models is happening right now, albeit in different conditions online, but the importance of showing up in public spaces the way we have showed up today is truly significant because we are seeing convergence of um, capacities um, through different platforms like the one you are offering in ways that are forcing us in this online format to do more, to do more in a diversified way and to be engaged in the public spaces this way that is probably disseminated the most um, through virtual ways. So I would like to speak a little bit about um, my practice as well as my engagement on the question of leadership in the World Academy of Art and Science um, and to honor the, uh, you know, the legacy of that institution, which this year celebrates 60 years of founding in 1960 by the masterminds of um, Bertrand Russell or Albert Einstein and many other um, disillusioned scientists of the Cold War era, but very enheartened human beings uh, that started from a conference um, in the US that called for social responsibility of science. And to this day, we are grappling with that question. What social responsibility in any domain of human activity means today for us, especially in the new context of multifaceted um, pressures of which uh, Madam Kitagawa was speaking, uh, that we are seeing unprecedented pressures of global crises, a convergence of multiple crises of which you, Kehkashan, spoke earlier as well. And what are the ways in which we can meaningfully be invested forward, to quote what you just mentioned. So in that sense, we are witnessing uh, anywhere from the tremendous threat of, of uh, nuclear weapons um, then uh, climate emergency, economic distress, um, but equally at the same time, we are seeing activation of social agency and social movements. So that there is a counterpoint 
to what is facing humanity, that the humanity in that moment is rising. And that's a significant, um, that's a significant phenomenon that we're witnessing today. And in so many ways, science and technology have enabled the connectivity that we needed. And the virus has certainly provided the pressure for us to realize our interdependency bound to that interconnectivity and the decision uh, is on us today. I think how to activate the science, technological innovation and respond, being capable to meaningfully and in, with an inspired responsibility, respond to the crisis by enabling the, the greater humanity to, um, to respond meaningfully, to respond resiliently, to respond in a visionary way so that we can build better. Um, in that sense, the question of uh, what preoccupies me at the threshold, I think, and it, at this decisive moment of the direction that the human developing is, is, is going to take, is the quality of human decision. And in that sense, historically speaking, we have seen that out of the tremendous crises um, worldwide and in different regions throughout history, um, opportunities and many opportunities arose. We have made decisions differently and at a higher level at some crucial inter historical intersections and junctures. So we have seen anywhere from the um, you know, uh, nuclear ban treaty of which uh, Dr. Zerbo spoke. I mean, that's a decision that arose out of crises. We have seen human rights um, declaration. We have seen the founding of the United Nations and you know, proliferation of um, NGOs, social movements and organizations and international organizations, right? A leadership that, that was scaled on a global level. We have seen all these things and more recently, we have seen unprecedented development in the adoption of the sustainable development goals. Truly unprecedented agreement of 193 countries on the priorities for humanity and the ways in which to meet human needs on the basic level, but also to respond to and create conditions for human aspiration most importantly. So we have seen historically what we are capable of, but what concerns me today, are we able to create culture of peace? Are we able to make better decisions without significant human sacrifice? That's, that's what we find most worrisome be because if we are able to rise in consciousness and respond conscientiously, I think that uh, we are at the level evolutionary stage where we should be able to do that without tremendous human sacrifice that we've seen in the name of, of that better development. And in that sense, um, I am speaking about the question of leadership uh, on a very intimate and private um, scale, as well as on the broadest collective scale possible, not as a nurturing of single-handed leadership of a particular um, national figure, what I'm speaking about is activation, connecting and activating collective intelligence for social, um, as a social process for solution generation. In other words, today it is on all of us. And as uh, uh, Madam Kitagawa mentioned, it is not going to be one initiative. It can't be one initiative, one organization, one nation. Uh, no matter how powerful, not even one single international organization that is going to be able to spearhead this process. These are the times where we're rising in consciousness to consciously evolve and to connect the dots, if you will, the historical dots, learn those historical lessons in order to lead forward. So the quality of human decision in so many ways is going to depend essentially on values uh, that we feel sourced in, and that we then project onto all of our creation. Um, in other words, the value that determines the worth and the price of everything. So at the center of systemic change is the question of the qualitative shift in mindset equally as in money, in consciousness as in capital, as just different manifestations of the same value in the material domain, or in the spiritual domain as that um, space of universal values that we share 
and in this context that we have shown are deeply interdependent. So, so in that sense, being based in values is something that can touch on um, questions of values in science development, in scientific uh, probing and research, uh, in the quality of our innovations and the purpose of our innovation, in the shifting of financial systems and the sense of economic justice that is so necessary, in the domain of political governance and the level at which we can see accountability for the stage that we find ourselves in. Everything hinges on those values. And any time, you know, uh, values that you have mentioned, Kekashan, such as justice, peace building, um, trust building, um, integrity, integral approach to anything. The criticism tends to be that that's something ephemeral, supposedly. Um, values are highly practical, precise and practical uh, substance of which we are made, and, um, and that we need to pay uh, a value, pay uh, attention to. Now, what I find most fascinating, and this will be my last point and hope to uh, get more insight from, from questions and to share more. What I find fascinating is that, as I said earlier, we're not lacking knowledge because not only have we done very well in diagnosing current issues, we know what's dysfunctional. We know what has not worked and proactively created more problems, which is the system we are currently inhabiting and the paradigm of values that we're applying currently. But also it's fascinating that we know what we want. We're not lacking in vision either. And so many organizations over the decades, past decades of past in this century have called for that vision. The culture of peace of which we've spoken earlier, United Nations have pr proposed certain values or so many wonderful organizations around the world. But the question of how to transition and the steps that we need to take right now are profoundly based in personal responsibility and collective response. And in that sense, um, I think that there's a key spiritual equation, if you will, that we can apply. Um, that there, this is the time of tremendous pressures where only paradoxes uh, that, we, that we need to uh, think of. So exactly at the time of starvation, believe me, it just might serve us right to invest more in arts and culture because that's what revives human spirit and engages human energy to take us forward and, and generate new creativity of which Dr. Zerbo spoke, as well as Madam Kitagawa. I mean, so if we started thinking in terms of paradoxes, we, could, we just might find the proper inflection points and intervention uh, portals, if you will, to shift the entire system to take that quantum leap towards higher um, quality of human decision. And we could really think if there's an, there's an intelligence with which the virus moves, we can unleash a different kind of intelligence to meet it and see, replicate the wisdom of the moment and of this um, stressor that is, that is put in front of us and see what is the intelligence of this very um, life form that showed up and unleash that towards creative and higher involving principle. So in that sense, I look forward to a finer human beings and a more refined uh, quality of human decision daily for each of us and all of us collectively. Thank you so much for uh, speaking. First of all, about, I think the most important thing that I gained from that is that, you know, historically we have been able to respond to crisis with, from the UN to the SDGs, but now we need to see how we can adopt a culture of peace and achieve quality human development without tremendous human sacrifice. And of course, we need the collaboration of everyone to, as you said, consciously evolve. And that depends on our value system. And I think definitely combining the power of different disciplines and different sources of intelligence can help us on the way forward. And it's really sad that, you know, the virus has provided the pressure for us, as you said, to realize our interdependency of all of humankind and of nature. But 
I think it is still a way for us to look at it as an opportunity. And we've seen how science and technology have helped us and enabled the connectivity. And hopefully we can continue with this collaboration and ensure that we truly create a new normal where no one is left behind. So thank you once again for sharing your remarks. I would now like to invite our next panelist, Ambassador Thomas Graham, former Special Representative for President Clinton for Arms Control, Nonproliferation, and Disarmament. Ambassador Graham, you have the floor. Ambassador Graham, you're muted. All right. I'm, I'm technically challenged, but I think that did it. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, okay. Well, thank you, Ketchikan, for inviting me uh, to, Ketchikan, sorry, for inviting me to uh, uh, participate in this very interesting uh, webinar. Uh, my take is slightly different, but just slightly, and I come out in this pretty much the same place. Um, humankind has been fighting among itself for 4,000 years uh, since the beginning of civilization. Its war is probably in our DNA. And, and government incompetence also goes far back into history. I can cite you some very prominent examples of it, but that there are many examples. And so we have no... Uh, we have no uh, special claim to, to that today, uh, and uh, nor to the dangers of war. But I don't think of history as being normal or abnormal. I think of history as going through periods and be, being generally, or generally cyclical. Uh, just to look at the modern era, we had the so-called European century, from uh, the end of the Napoleonic Wars um, to the Crimean War, and then collapsing into World War I. And then we had a period of 20 years between the wars, uh, which was essentially uncertain, and that collapsed into World War II. And, and then after World War II, we had uh, a long period of peace in the sense of no major war uh, and, and, a, and an international society based on treaties and rules, uh, but also at the very same time, we had the Cold War, which was probably the most dangerous period humanity has ever gone through. Uh, just a slight error of a few seconds could have brought a global nuclear war. And the Cold War ended, and now we're in another period of uncertainty and uh, misunderstanding about where, we're, lack of understanding about where we're going. But this may be coming to an end, and uh, we we may be coming to some kind of end of this period, just like uh, uh, the the periods before World War One. And World War II, and um, we're confronting a truly enormous crisis, uh, both with respect to nuclear weapons and global warming, which are linked. Because if we don't stop global warming, then there's going to be a greater tendency for countries to want nuclear weapons to protect the arable land and water sources that they may have that other states may be trying to get, having lost theirs as a result of climate change. And vice versa, um, uh, uh, climate change itself uh, has the uh, capability to uh, bring at least civilization as we know it uh, to a, an end and the effect of climate change could, in the end, be uh, even greater than, than all-out uh, nuclear war. Uh, both are, 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 are extremely dangerous, they're linked, and uh, they require um, good leadership, 
intelligent policies and lots of financial and just ordinary work effort to have a chance um, to resolve them. Um, uh, with, well, a lot has been done, of course, with respect to, uh, to um, nuclear weapons. Uh, we have the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. We should have the CTBT if it wasn't for the United States, the United States Senate, I want to point out. Uh, and and um, uh, and nuclear weapons have not been used since the first time they were used. That's not to say they won't be, but it's no guarantee. But we've gone 75 years without with successfully uh, uh, containing nuclear war, we uh, and new, the use of nuclear weapons. But we haven't done nearly as well uh, with climate change. Uh, uh, there were any, there were several times in the past when the stars were aligned right, when it might have been stopped. Um, uh, the end of the 1980s, there was a consensus uh, which collapsed. And even in the year 2000, uh, if uh, the election had come out differently, probably we would, that is the US anyway, would have led uh, the world in the direction of doing something effective about climate change. But neither of those things worked out. And uh, we now have a situation where there's an enormous amount of carbon in the atmosphere. And about half of it was put there in the last 30 years. And uh, it, to solve it now, to solve climate change, uh, global warming, and at the same time, keep control of, keep our uh, controls over nuclear weapons from falling apart under the pressure of climate change, is going to take uh, cooperation between nations of a greater quality than has ever existed in human history. War is off the table. Conflict is off the table. If we're going to prevail, against two, two linked existential crises. And uh, the longer we squabble over, no, I shouldn't say squabble, the longer we fight over places like Afghanistan or, or Eastern Europe or wherever it may be, the longer we're putting off doing something effective about solving climate change and we're allowing uh, the controls over nuclear weapons to gradually weaken. The NPT is not what it was 25 years ago because of the failure to uh, bring the CTBT into force, which was the essential um, political price for uh, nuclear non-proliferation in 68 and in 95. Uh, the problem in the Middle East that's been raised in the last two review conferences. And then this problem I've been describing about the effect of climate change uh, uh, on states pressing them in the direction of acquiring nuclear weapons when they might not otherwise uh, do so. So um, uh, what we must have and must find a way to develop is a culture of peace that will result in nations being willing to cooperate totally in, in confronting these twin existential crises. There's no substitute for that. We can't prevail unless we get this degree of, of uh, cooperation. If every nation doesn't do it, uh, we won't be able to do it because everyone has to participate in order to uh, prevail. And so um, I would urge that, that all of us work in the direction of a culture of peace, which will serve as a catalyst to push countries in the direction of 
everyone cooperating with everyone, regardless of regime or or anything else. And uh, and then at the same time, to do the maximum effort to keep the structure that we have today that that uh, to some degree controls nuclear weapons. It's not perfect, but it's it's certainly a whole lot better than nothing. And we've we've lost part of it already, and never acquired the part of it that we should have been able to. The test ban, and and the, those things have to change. And and so, um, culture of peace, close cooperation among all states, strengthen the non-proliferation treaty and related treaties, and do everything possible. Uh, for all nations to work together to stop um, global warming. Um, uh, if, if we don't, then all our efforts against nuclear weapons won't really be that valuable because we lost out to climate change. We must not let that happen. And really, there's no alternative to this. There, it's not even arguable. We have to do this. We have to have a culture of peace. We have to have fully, total uh, international cooperation. We have to do what we can to strengthen the protections against nuclear weapons and do everything we can to stop global warming. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Graham. And you're so right. The issues are interconnected. And as you said countries might use nuclear weapons as a false sense of security which some of them are already doing to supposedly defend their lands and resources from being used by others something that can be exacerbated by global warming and thank you for also reiterating the importance of cooperation amongst all nations and how it's imperative that we have a culture of peace that can ensure that we cooperate to solve these linked existential crises and that we need the participation of everyone so that we can prevail and save humanity and the world from total annihilation. So I thank you once again for your remarks. And we shall now move on to our next panelist, the Right Reverend William Swing, President and Founding Trustee of the United Religions Initiative. Bishop Swing, you have the floor. Thank you, Kekashan. Um, wonderful to be here and uh, wonderful to listen um, at this particular moment in California in the Bay Area, uh, Sonoma County is on fire, uh, Napa County is on fire, and uh, people are losing their homes, people are losing uh, their animals, people are losing their uh, livelihood. Um, and uh, what's happening is that uh, all kinds of folks are rushing in to provide uh, emergency housing, uh, food. Uh, firefighters from all over the United States are driving their trucks uh, to, be, to be here to fight the fire. Um, uh, it's, you talk about a culture of peace. How about a culture of running to address the crisis? I think that's what peace is. It's running to address the crisis. If you don't run to address it, it <laughs> You aren't going to have a culture of peace, but if you do, the folks who are trying to help will discover each other and they'll discover a community among each other and they will be agents of peace. They'll be agents of a, a new way of living. So um, uh, there's a lot to be learned from today in California in the Bay Area. Uh, also, this is a very important day for me. Uh, 41 years ago today, I was consecrated as Bishop, uh, Bishop of California. So uh, today is my anniversary. And uh, <laughs> all right, I'm with you. Good, good for me. Um, I came here from the hills of West Virginia, <clears throat> like Tom came from the hills of Kentucky. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, all Diane Feinstein, who was mayor, said, "Could you house? We got a little problem with homeless. Could you just house some of these homeless inside?" So sure. Grace Cathedral first night, 40 people homeless. Second night, 
250 people homeless. This was 1981, 80. Uh, right after that, it was 1,600 people. We housed 1,600 people every night for the next 25 years, fed millions of people. And what I discovered is you can't do that by being the Episcopal Church. You got to do that with the Lutherans and the Jews and the Muslim and the Hindus and and the non-believers and the agnostics. And then you got to do it with the city government. Um, if you're going to do, if you're going to answer the crisis, you got to get beyond your own um, brand. You got to get out in the street and play in the traffic with everybody. And uh, uh, that creates something. And that was followed by the um, Loma Prieta earthquake, and a lot of the town went down, a lot of the Bay Area, by the Oakland Hills fire, and then by the AIDS uh, crisis. I'd go to one church and there'd be 25 people dead, average age uh, 36. I'd go to another church, there'd be 40 people dead, average age 36. Um, their parents were coming in from out of the, from all over the place, and they didn't know that their child was gay, and they didn't know their child was dying, and uh, who's going to do what about what? Who's going to take care of the, the dying? Who's going to take care of the loved ones of the dying? Who's going to take care of the family? Um, the people who rushed in to assist the crisis uh, figured out a bond between them. And that created a culture of peace. It's not a theoretical thing, it's a practical thing. And out of that came um, two things. <laughs> One of them was uh, uh, the interfaith community got closer and closer together. And we decided, okay, how can we permanently uh, address the issues of the city? And uh, so the San Francisco Interfaith Council, I received bulletins from them maybe twice or three times a day. Uh, 800 churches in San Francisco are part of this. And you think of San Francisco, when you see it on television, you say, well, nobody goes to church. <laughs> nobody, nobody believes in God in that God-forsaken place. I tell you, there are 800 churches, synagogues, mosques, and they all work together every day. To, I saw it this morning. It says, uh, here's how to help people fill out their census form. This is what we're going to do about uh, COVID in the city today. This is what we're going to do about uh, in, uh, emergency preparedness. Uh, here's how to help the city. Um, we found each other and we became something here. And uh, it changes the city. Also out of that same group came a group that founded the United Religions Initiative to try to do the same thing in the city, just do it all over the world and make it very practical, not theoretical. You know, what are you gonna do about uh, a well? What are you gonna do about uh, education? What are you gonna do about orphans? What are you gonna do about drinking water? What are you gonna do about nuclear weapons? Get people who are, whose heart is moving in the direction and uh, let them find each other and let them work together. Uh, run, people who are running to assist in the crisis, let them find each other. Now we get to COVID. <laughs> COVID is an inter-religious virus. Uh, <laughs> it goes to India and kills Hindus. Uh, it goes to uh, Israel and kills Jews. It goes to, uh, they can't even have uh, many people going around in Saudi Arabia at the Hajj because Muslims are dying, Christians are dying. Uh, it's a, uh, we gotta, it's, it's one thing to have your own covenant with God and it's another thing to say, but what is that covenant? What responsibilities to the whole, whole society does that make on us? And what kind of bedfellows do we need to find out there in the world to share in, in practical ministry to the world? Not theoretical, practical ministry to the world. So, um, so that's what we're working on. I, you know, Tom talks about climate change. 
we're not going to get to climate change unless the religious leaders and the religious followers of the world raise their voice and run run to the crisis. Uh, immigration. Uh, there are people moving all over the world today, fleeing one country, fleeing one regime, fleeing for their lives, drug cartels, fleeing everything. Uh, what are we going to do with all these people? Uh, we're going to have to have a new comprehensive way of, of being immigrants together. Uh, we, we've got to reach down into ourselves and, and understand our own uh, spiritual mobility. We're all on pilgrimage. Nobody's arrived. We're all on pilgrimage. Um, uh, we've got to stop religious persecution. We've got to stop teaching our children to hate the people of other religions. Because sooner or later, that's going to manifest itself. And somebody's going to die because of what you believe about God. We got to get the religious leaders to begin to um, run to the crisis of religious persecution. Your own people are going to be persecuted. You got to, for your own sake, you got to stop this. And for the world's sake, you got to stop. So, uh, the only word that jumped out at me when you gave this instruction for today was the word comprehensive. And I was thinking, yeah, that's right. Uh, everything. We got to rush to the crisis in a comprehensive way and make sense out of it and do the best we can. So that's my, those are my words on this day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bishop Swing. And first of all, we are so happy to be part of your anniversary as Bishop and congratulations. And thank you for joining us on such an auspicious day. And thank you for the tremendous work that you have done to truly make our, better, uh, our world a better place to live in. And you're right, we do need to have a culture of running to solve crisis comprehensively, and that will really enable us to have a culture of peace. And we do need to understand that we have a responsibility, not just to our own community, but to the whole world. And the culture of peace must be a, a practical thing. So thank you once again for being with us today, and especially on this auspicious day. And now I would like to invite our next panelist, Ms. Velma Sharic, founder and president, Post-Conflict Research Center from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Ms. Velma, you have the floor. Thank you so, so much, Kevish, and thank you so much for the invitation and to you and Green, uh, Green Hope Foundation. It has been a great pleasure and it has been such an inspirational panel. And somehow I feel proud to speak after Bishop Swing because what he mentioned regarding being practical, I'm going to kind of try to talk during my presentation or during, during my time. Uh, as you know, I'm coming from Bosnia. Uh, my teenage per per period was quite hectic, I would say. I grew up in war, being refugee for three and a half years really suffering with, you know, my people and the people from the region. So that is actually what brought me to, to the field of peace building and post-conflict transformation. And I'm doing this work now for almost 20 years. It has been mostly based on uh, creative and innovative peace building, where we are using as a main tool multimedia, art and culture. As Mila mentioned, we should, we should kind of use much more these tools because they have been incredible tool, at least in the case of Bosnia. But I'm going to give you a little bit of background from where I'm coming and why it's so important to work in the field of peace building. 25 years ago, we had severe war, more than uh, 100,000 people have been killed. Uh, more than 2 million people have been refugees, uh, very bloody conflict, uh, much more complicated is that the country is divided now on 10 entities, two cantons, so we have a state level, and for example, we have 186 ministries, but we are three and a half million people. So basically, we are like Washington DC territory. <laughs> we have Jews, uh, we have Muslims, we have Orthodox, we have Christians, we have others, those are people from mixed marriage and people who actually are LGBT or Roma. So. It's really, really complicated. We have a biased media, we have nationalistic rhetoric politicians, we have a high level of corruption and nepotism, and literally it's not just in Bosnia, this is for the whole region of Western Balkans. And as you know, this area is extremely important because it's standing on a very important geopolitical spot between 
Turkey and, uh, you know, in Europe and all this. So what we did, literally, we did what Bishop Sig just mentioned. We tried to go on the ground and be practitioner using all tools we have, creating different multimedia educational creative innovative projects so i'm going to mention a few where where literally i can kind of prove that for us prevention prevention of conflict and prevention in genocide in this case because in bosnia as maybe you know it was also latest genocide which happened in 1995 in srebrenica which resulted of that of more than uh, eight uh, eight thousand uh, five hundred uh, people who have been systematically killed in July 1995. So what we do, we do genocide prevention and mass atrocity, and we do this through building different coalitions, working mostly with civil society and non-governmental sector, because unfortunately we still don't have a strong um, willingness by the local politicians or regional politicians to work closely with us in civil society on building peace. So what we do, we create our own coalitions or our own networks where we closely work with the United Nations Office of, of Special Advisor for Genocide Prevention and Mass Atrocities by trying to educate civil society and non-governmental sector in the mechanisms of genocide and conflict prevention. We found this extremely important, but it is also about creating a, a connection between the UN office. Sometimes, you know, for us in Balkan, UN is quite distant body based somewhere in New York City. So if we have a close connection and if we work with them directly, it's much more easier. So through this network, we utilize more than 120 civil society and non-governmental organizations from the region western of, uh, of Balkan. And now we are working more toward policy recommendations, toward um, a creation of certain networks in certain countries and building a joint action plan. So prevention number one for us is the key for peace building. A second, second is prevention of hate speech and anti-discrimination. We heard about that. We see all these racial issues which, which are going on and, and, and being a big problem. But in our case, a hate speech, hate speech, which is a tool of our local national politicians who mostly use pre-war pre rhetoric or war rhetoric for raising uh, much more tensions now. They use media. We have media who serve as, a, as a satellites of political parties, mostly national broadcasters. So what we are trying to do, we are trying to work um, toward creating our own multimedia tools using social media as a platform and trying to kind of co combat these uh, uh, national broadcasters and those who are trying to serve to us bias and, and, and you know, um, information which they would like to present to, to, to the public. Uh, as I mentioned, we had, unfortunately, a large number of, of, of victims during the latest war. So what we do through, through our work, also as a part of conflict prevention, but also as a part of education, uh, we are trying to provide a platform for survivors who are coming from all these different ethnic groups where we are creating multimedia platforms or just platforms that they can say their stories because briefly we still don't know how we will deal with the recent past. For example, we cannot go and teach in the classrooms, not even peace education. So with 186 ministries we have, with the full administration, we still don't have a state a ministry for education, for example. Uh, we have a pure phenomenon, I would say, of segregation, two schools under one roof, where kids of different ethnic or, or, or national uh, groups, they are going physically in the same school, but they are separated through curriculum or through, through, through the whole. So, uh, to be honest, uh, for us, that is really, really uh, a, a huge problem. And what we do now is non-formal non education, unfortunately. We still cannot get approval from our local politician to teach in schools, but we are trying to avoid the system and do as much we can in non-governmental sector by creating stories of moral courage and rescue behavior, for example. I will mention just one project because I can keep going and going with a bunch of problems we have. It's not so, I mean, I'm usually optimistic, but you know, it's not, it's not so bad, everything. But I'm going to mention, what, for example, one project we created with the name Ordinary Heroes. 
as we don't know still how we would present recent history and recent war, we found a way to overcome this problem by building multimedia educational project where we are featuring stories of moral courage and rescue behavior from Holocaust, Rwanda, Cambodia, and Bosnia. So literally, we are looking people who overcross ethnic or religious boundaries and during the war or genocide or Holocaust, they were helping or they were saving lives of others, where we uh, literally are exposing young people to these stories to film, uh, photographic exhibitions, stories of moral courage, testimonies of these people or specialized workshops which we um, have created with, with, with hope that we will initiate pro-social behavior among young people, that we will kind of build up bridge between these different inter-ethnic and inter-religious groups by just showing these moral example, pure moral examples of moral courage and rescue behavior. And it, it's really working, it's really working. We have monitoring and evaluation and some research being done in this field. So whoever is more interested, I can share it. I'm not going to take more time. But I mean, uh, everything what we heard through panel, literally I can testify through the work I do in my own country and my own region. We really do need to see a, a peace building and, and cultivating the culture of peace as, as a common action. It should be, uh, I completely agree, it cannot be done by the willingness of, of, of governments. We do see that in Bosnia. We do see that in the region of Western Balkans where the, our local politicians and leaders, they don't have agreement or they don't want to find agreement. And we are still really, really stuck in, in, in the past and we are really struggling. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to repeat. Let's leave some time for, for questions. I just want to say thank you for including Bosnia. Thank you for including this part of the world because it's really important to keep us in the loop. We still need a lot of help and we still need, you know, especially during the pandemic, we are still struggling in, in, in this part of the world. So this is like, yeah, this is uh, for us really, really important to feel included in, in the rest of the world. So, yeah. I'm going to stop here and let's leave some time for questions. Thank you so much, Ms. Velma, for bringing the real life situation from Bosnia. And thank you for sharing with us the concrete ground level actions that you have taken through multimedia education from creating a platform for survivors of the war and genocide to share their stories. And the fact that you all have persisted and continued the education through non-formal means. And it is truly amazing to hear about the positive impact that you have made. And we are extremely inspired to see your courage and positivity. So I thank you once again. And I thank all the panelists for such a meaningful discussion. And you know, the world truly needs more people like you. And we will now move on to our question and answer session. I can see uh, we have hands raised. So the first question is from Alio. So Alio, I am promoting you to a panelist. Let's see. Okay. Alio will be joining us as a panelist shortly. And hopefully it works. Great, Aliu, if you can unmute yourself. Hi everyone, I'm Aliu J. Pusa from Liberia, a volunteer with Green Hall Foundation. I just want to commend all of our panelists for the uh, brilliant, very inspiring deliberation on peace. And also I want to commend them and encourage them to continue with their work in ensuring a very peaceful and a one world. My questions have to do with uh, uh, with the uh, current situation in the world of uh, holding to fight the pandemic, the increase of hunger, nuclear or power supremacy, or inequality. Uh, all of our panelists, this is a question for everyone. Uh, as a policymaker or as a person who work with uh, religious or interfaith community, how can you make children the center point of your peace building or awareness? Thank you very much, Aliu. Would uh, one of our panelists like to start the discussion?
Dr. Popovich, I see you've unmuted. <laughs> yes, I was waiting to see if there's a, other volunteers, but um, fortunately for us, um, the children have made themselves the centerpiece. Um, Aliyu, I really appreciate your question because this is the question of the future, not only of the current humanity, but the generations going forward. And the children have gotten fed up um, you know, all over the world, whether there are places of hunger, whether there are places of abundance such as the US, uh, but they saw, for example, after the, the, you know, the phenomenon of school shooting, that the schools would be just quickly washed up and in no time, in a matter of days, our children would be sent back to school, the parents would go back to work, and we would all pretend like nothing happened, and it did not create national emergency. Uh, this is just one example in, intentionally to showcase a situation from a developed, um, let me say industrially developed country, um, who claims its power and at the same time neglects its children, not to mention how many millions of hungry children there are in the US. And again, I'm intentionally putting US on the map instead of focusing on developing countries as if there's something symptomatic about them and it's their own failure that they're hungry. So I'm intentionally putting this, the power of the day um, in the forefront. And the children have put themselves at the centerpiece saying, we don't trust you and we don't trust adults anymore. We don't think you're evolved enough to understand where we are at, whether we're hungry or we are neglected uh, psycho-emotionally or socially, and we are uh, maybe fed, but neglected that in that way. And to see the level of leadership uh, from the youth that have showed up, say, in front of the UN to demonstrate against us endangering and indebting their future, um, I think it was not, um, a matter of resistance in front of the UN, they showed up to um, open arms to say, we want to work with you because maybe this is the seat in front of which we get to call for responsibility. Um, in my own practice, which starts from my own motherhood, <laughs> from my intercontinental identities that span from the Balkans of which um, Mrs. Sharic spoke so, so poignantly and so powerfully all the way to the US, um, in my own professional work at the meta policy level making, I feel that my responsibility goes towards the concept of seven generations of which we have learned from the uh, native uh, nations of, of the North America. Um, so calling, I'm intentionally showcasing these um, spaces of wisdom and, and appearing in public spaces because I think that there's a nece necessary intergenerational and um, intersocietal um, collaboration that needs to happen. When we start connecting youth wisdom with the wisdom of elderly who are quickly dispensed of once there are not productive bodies in the industrial system, right, in the industrial economic system, once we do that, and as we are currently doing, we're going to fill in the necessary link uh, in wisdom uh, uh, distribution and dissemination that we need and for action taking that we're missing. So learning and knowledge sharing across regions of which um, Ms. Sharic has spoken, across regions, across um, uh, uh, conflict situations that have already generated new wisdom from that conflict, right? And across generations is key uh, to be able to do that. Of course, the responsibility is personal on a daily basis, but the children have shown tremendous leadership that in which, uh, you know, just to think what it takes to, um, what it takes to organize one's peaceful protest. You understand that it's the finest and the highest level of intelligence that you have to apply to be able to do that. And the youth has already successfully done so. It is on us to really uh, respond with accountability as adults to what the children have already voiced. And I really appreciate that you're saying that because to be hungry on an abundant planet is a moral abomination. Uh, and to not have shelter and basic needs met on an abundant planet is abomination. And the children have already called us to that responsibility. It is our job now to put that at the highest level of policy. Of course, thank you so much. I saw uh, Ambassador Graham who raised his hand and I saw uh, Dr. Zervo who raised his hand and I see Madam Kitagawa raised her hand. So Ambassador Graham, then Dr. Zervo and Madam Kitagawa.
Thank you, Katyashan. Um, I would just like to comment on Dr. Popovic's uh, uh, comment, comments. Um, um, uh, the United States uh, right now has done a very, very bad job with the uh, with dealing with the virus and has demonstrated a level of leadership historically low by our standards. Uh, it's never been this bad. I mean, it's been bad, but it's never been this bad. Uh, but turning to the children, why would they trust the uh, the older generation? Uh, the older generation uh, brought them nuclear weapons and, and at least tried to do something about it and did do something about it with the non-proliferation treaty and the test ban treaty, which still isn't enforced. But it, it believe me, uh, having experience uh, in that area, it's very difficult to make progress. But we did make some. We tried. On climate change, which is going to be irreversible in 20 or 30 years, most likely, uh, we, we've effectively done nothing. I mean, there's the people that have tried, but the, uh, the fossil fuel companies have just dominated the scene for the last 30 years, and, and very little progress has been made. And so why would they trust us? The fate of the civilization, fate of our civilization is gonna be in the next generation hands and I hope they do well, because if they don't, uh, it'll be too late for the generation that follows them. So everything will be on their shoulder and uh, shoulders. And I very much hope and pray that they will do the job that I know they're capable of. Thank you so much, Ambassador Graham. Dr. Zerbo, you're uh, not mute. You're on, put on mute. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kekashan. Um, uh, I think I, uh, both uh, Ambassador Tom Graham and uh, uh, Ms. Popovich have uh, eloquently put how the, we, can put, we can make children the center uh, of all we do. I just wanted to, to share a picture with you. It's, uh, when I talk about the CTVT Youth Group, I got this. It's a one-year-old boy from California Hey, who, uh, when we started the youth group, wanted to be a member, and he sent this to me. He said, I won't let you down, Dr. Zerbo, in your fight to make the world a better place. So uh, this is something that I have uh, been so touched in uh, investing in youth. Youth will start from one year uh, to 85. 85 because I have... Uh, Another great friend from California, no, from, uh, from Florida, by the way. Uh, uh, this is um, Dr. Kemret, who is 84 years old. And then he say, I will not retire until the CTBT enters into force. And I'm sure Tom Graham will know what I'm talking about. So making the youth the center of what we do, and Ms. Popovich said that the youth have made themselves the center. How can the generation that Ambassador Graham is talking about, it's true, we've made progress in non-proliferation treaty, in uh, nuclear disarmament, but it's only up to the young people to decide now how and where they want to live, the type of world they want to live in. And this is why the leadership of people like uh, Kekashan and many of the young people that we meet today who are advocating for a better world, advocating for the world free of nuclear weapon, advocating for uh, climate change, and they're doing it without asking us whether we want or not. They're doing it by themselves and inspiring us to basically follow suit, and that's what we're doing. We're following today the younger generation because they are in social media. They're the one leading social media today, and social media is basically leading our world. But I wanted to add one point as well is what uh, Ms. Sarish said, because uh, Bosnia has always been a place, uh, I would say, close to my heart, because in my university days, when I was hearing about uh, uh, the civil war and the problems there, I've always wondered why in the middle of Europe uh, we will see what people felt will never happen. And that's what we saw in the Balkans. And Ms. Saris, I met uh, one official, uh, your deputy prime minister last week here in Vienna, 
And that was a question that I was asking. But the hope that is coming there is when she told me a story of her own family, a grave that has Jewish, Muslim, and Christian, the same grave. And that gave me that hope that when we talk about a culture of peace, the culture of peace should come from Bosnia. Bosnia should today, out of all the tragedy that has happened, lead that culture of peace and that culture of living together from the youth, from your generation, from the younger generation, to spread across what should never happen and how the world should be. And uh, the uh, Reverend talk about Muslim, Jews, Catholic, and everyone living together and then working together for a better world. That's what we should do. And I didn't know that in a, such a restrained place that Bosnia is like little Jerusalem, where you have in a short environment, Muslim, Jewish, Catholic, living together. And I think the younger generation, we should all visit Bosnia to see how it is as we visit Jerusalem and then how we can make this world a better place for all. That's what I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Zerbo. And we have uh, Madam Kita Gala, you've raised your hand. Well, thank you so much. And I'll make this very quick because I know we are short on time. But this is a very important question and how we can make our children the center point of peace building and awareness. And I think it's very important that we analyze the policies that we have created as well as the infrastructure that follows those policies that have mobilized this whole mindset that we have literally hypnotized ourselves into believing that we can have unlimited growth with limited resources. And that has caused all of the problems that we are trying so hard to address through the sustainable development goals, for example, that really are meant to deal with the symptoms that have arisen because of these policies where countries see as their national security interest the acquisition and control of, for example, natural resources that enrich ultimately a handful of people. And the moral outrage and moral stand that our children must take front and center stage is because not only are their future, are they are future, but we also will be shaping the consciousness of these young people and this important aspect that, uh, you know, uh, Mila try to uh, inculcate in the conversation today, that it is raising all of us to the higher levels of consciousness that will allow our children to grow up with proper values. And we must take a look at those infrastructures and institutions that have created this inequality and so evaporated global wealth into fewer and fewer hands that have basically decimated the moderating fulcrum point and balance of the middle class. And we really have to do a comprehensive analysis as to why these institutions, policies, and infrastructures that we have created and the values that have entailed following all of these to make the material acquisition more important than the values of caring for each other and developing the heart of compassion and kindness. And unless we can inculcate these values, these ethical principles for living in our young people by setting the example our, ourselves, uh, we have a lot of work to do within our own selves to develop the moral code of proper behavior and conduct. Thank you so much. Uh, we have two more questions and I've promoted uh, them to panelists already. So since we're running out of time, we'd like to request our panelists to stay on for about 10 more minutes so that we can answer the last two questions. Uh, thank you so much, Eliu, for your question and I'm an attendee. And our next question is uh, from Ananya Chaudhary. So if Ananya, if you can unmute uh, yourself. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, it is my honor to hear from all of you today. So I'm Ananya from India. And my question is to all the panelists. What, if any, is the greatest opportunity the COVID-19 pandemic presents to the world today? Thank you. Thank you, Ananya. Uh, any of our panelists like to take that? Bishop Swing, I know you had your hand raised earlier, so would you like to start? If you can unmute yourself. Yes. Uh, I'll answer the last question. 
Or you'll answer the last one. Well, yeah, the uh, the solution okay. to homelessness. The solution to homelessness is a home. And the way you make a home is to have a family. And whose family do you belong to? If you're a young person, you say, "Who's my family?" And it's our it's our responsibility to let young people know they're part of a global family uh, of of all the faiths, all the um, cultures, all the tribes. Uh, that there uh, there all there's a kinship. Uh, if there's not if there's not a sense of kinship, then it's just us against them, our family against your family, our tribe against your tribe, etc. Ultimately, we got to get from homelessness to a home, home to a family, family to a, a global family, and 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 there, young people can find kinship and solve the problems. Otherwise, I guarantee you, on a corner in Pakistan right now, uh, there are some radical folks who are uh, recruiting young people on the corner today. Uh, we got to be on the corner recruiting young people for a bigger world. That's That was my answer to the last question. Thank you so much. And Ambassador Graham, and since we're running out of time, we'll take two comments from our panelists and then move on to the next one. Ambassador Graham, you have the floor. Given the time, why don't we just move to the next question? Uh, but would any of you like to ask? Answer well, the, day, uh, the world faces a great crisis today, and one of maybe the greatest it's ever faced, and the fact that uh, climate change is an existential threat, and so is nuclear weapons. And, uh, and we just need to do a whole lot more about both of them, especially climate change. But um, I would uh, cite the, the first um, chief of staff to President Obama uh, famously said, and he was being a little bit light here, but there's a ring of truth to it. We should never let a good crisis go to waste. And this is an opportunity if we do take up the mantle and do face these crises and do get the world to all cooperate together, we'll have a better society. Awesome, thank you so much. And yes, uh, Dr. Kopovich. Very quickly, I want to point out what, to what is already happening, not something that we, should that we should do or will happen if we take certain action. If one school girl refuses to go to school and manages to build a movement within 12 months of millions to follow suit, you know what's possible and what is possible by youth. You know who I'm speaking of, right? So at the same time, uh, the children, we should not be putting the responsibility on children that they, this is their world and this is what they need to do. As Madame Kitagawa said, it's our responsibility to support the potential and the seeding of the, of the divine within each child to develop that a personal design in the world and to create conditions for the children to, ve to develop because the genuine goodness of the children is affirmed by the fact that they still go to school, they still go by our rules, they still want to be prove that they're good, good um, family members and community members and good children. I mean, this is a tremendous goodness in our children that is out there. And if one child refusing to go to school can bring this kind of change. Imagine what would happen if more children refuse to go to school. They would reveal tremendous dysfunction and fragility of the system that is not supporting them. That's, that's a quick note on that side. And the second one is, along with this refusal to serve the old system, I am not calling for brutal revolution. I'm calling for empathetic revolution. And that empathetic revolution has already taken place in the world. If over lives in the US, who we, who's, I, I really appreciate your excellency, Graham, that you volunteer US and with its critique, you know, self-effacing critique that you offered so genuinely, because, you know, the world generally is not trusting the US leadership right now. 
But when you American people showed up on, on the streets over universal value of the value of human life and dignity and Black Lives Matter and all lives matter only in so far that these lives matter, the entire world showed up in the streets, in the streets of Tehran, in the streets of Seoul, in Brussels, everywhere. We know where the priorities of humanities lie and we need to create conditions for them to connect into an empathetic revolution that is already taking its course right now. Awesome, thank you so much. And thank you Ananya for your question. And we shall now move on to our last question. Pragna, you have the floor. Thank you so much to all the panelists. This discussion has been such a great learning experience for all of us. I am Pragna from the United Arab Emirates. We all know that women play a crucial role in the disarmament dialogue, yet we are often excluded from such discussions. How can we ensure greater inclusivity as we work towards achieving nuclear disarmament? Awesome, thank you so much, Pragna. Uh, our panelists would like to take that. Yes, Madam Kiledala. Uh, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Okay, thank you so much. Women are actually the powerful agents of transformation and more and more we're going to see that. And women have over recent history made great strides in being able to be included in important conferences, convenings, and we cannot frankly exclude, oppress, repress, depress 50% of the world's population and think we can ever have world peace. That is a fiction. So if we really want to have peace, we really want to see you know, vast uh, transformations taking place, we must include women. And if you go to any village, anywhere in the world, who are the ones really working hard, not only taking care of the children and you know, the, all of the responsibilities that come with raising a family, but also working the fields and whatever spare time they have trying to do arts and crafts and finding whatever income they can you know, in any way that they can. So this kind of ability to multitask, the inherent intelligence and creativity of women must be harnessed because we are half of the world's population and we must raise our voices and demand greater inclusivity and be willing to step forward and show up uh, so that we can have these changes created. And God rest your soul, uh, you know, Supreme Court Justice Ruth uh, Bader Ginsburg, who just passed away, you know, said that change incur occurs over time. So this kind of incremental changes, and we have seen great changes to the great work of women to put forth the voices and the incorporation of women and all women and men everywhere should be willing to raise their voices and to create these opportunities of inclusivity. Thank you so much, Madam Kitagawa. Ambassador Graham, you had your hand raised. Fine. Oh, uh, you're on mute. I can't. <laughs> uh, I, I agree with everything that's been said, but I would note that the initial efforts have been made here. Our disarmament uh, delegations, for example, are, are, we've had women uh, in prominent places on them for a long period of time. Ambassador Gottemiller, for example, negotiated the new, the new uh, START treaty and and uh, the Congress in 2018 is democratic in the House side entirely because of the efforts <laughs> of women and kudos to them. Awesome, thank you. And I see a last, uh, two last comments, uh, Dr. Zerbo and Ms. Velma. So Dr. Zerbo, you have the floor. Just uh, Kikashin, just to add that uh, uh, I think women are, are getting more and more involved in the Zaman issue. If I take the the example of the CTBTO youth group, I think at some point we are close to 60% uh, women and, uh, uh, and that's a, uh, a sign that women are getting more and more part of this peace building, uh, this culture of peace, uh, because as um, Ms. Uh, uh, Kitagawa mentioned, you go to every part of the world, who are the hardworking people? Who are the people trying to 
uh, nurse the culture of peace. Uh, in Africa, in my part of the world, women are doing that and just that. And I think we need more and more young women uh, to play an important role in the different youth initiative, be it climate change and uh, all the existential threat that uh, uh, Dr. Graham has mentioned, both climate change and nuclear weapon. I think we need, we need them. And we have them already because today, uh, in terms of gender balance, uh, we see that we have more women than men. And that's already a sign that uh, we're moving in the right direction. Of course. Thank you so much, Dr. Zerba. And last comment from Ms. Velma. Uh, Dr. Zerba, thank you so much for the beautiful words about Sarajevo being, you know, city of uh, small, small Jerusalem. And I'm, I'm, I'm really moved. Thank you so much. Uh, I just want to mention a few things because if we are talking about, uh, about women, I have to mention the courage of the Bosnian woman we recently witness it to a um, couple of movements. So I would say that I want to be kind of practical uh, uh, saying that the best way of supporting women and maybe, you know, include more women would be a support among each other. If, if there is a woman's solidarity on a, on a local level, if there are networks, coalitions, women helping another woman, there is a great example for me, um, the Vital Voices, uh, Vital Voices, which is the U.S.-based non-governmental organization. I personally been mentee from Bosnia, and they really, really helped me and connected me with incredible women from all around the world and institution. I think Dr. Popovich is also uh, have experience working with the Vital Voices, being established by Hillary Clinton. So that is something what you can take a look and maybe you know, see is there any similar movements in your environment? Can you link? Can you do something to social media, connect and share solidarity and knowledge among each other? The Bosnian women, I'm going to go back just quickly and I will end it up. They have been showing incredible moral courage by standing in front of the International Tribunal for Former Yugoslavia. Uh, by giving the testimonies in the cases of sexual violence and rape, they change international law. Like literally after they testified in a couple of cases, rape became crime against humanity. And now we can prove that rape is happening somewhere in other parts of the world. This happened to like, you know, movements of rural women from Eastern Bosnia. They are not educated, quite well-connected women, but they stood up, they started to create coalitions, they started to work together. Mothers of Srebrenica, for example, who raised awareness about genocide in Srebrenica, and they established International Commission of Missing People, which now is helping through DNA method to find people missing in Syria and other parts of the world. These are rural women, uh, and this is possible only if we show solidarity and help, help, help each other to work together. So that is what, what I wanted to say. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ritz Bellman. I saw Bishop Swain, you had raised your hand. So if you wanted to comment. Sure. Uh, we, we started ordaining women to the priesthood in 1979. And last time, the presiding bishop of the entire church was a woman bishop. And uh, uh, it's changed the church considerably to have uh, women uh, in, in the top leadership uh, roles. And I think that when that happens in religions all over the world, in all religions, where women finally have a chance to make their voices heard and they take positions, I have a feeling that religions will be a whole lot more humane than they are now. Absolutely, thank you so much. And thank you so much, Ragna, for your very important question. And I am now making you an attendee. And to all of our panelists, I'd like to thank you for such an amazing discussion. And very quickly, in 30 seconds, I would uh, love for you to sum up your uh, remarks and uh, just, well, enlighten us. And we shall start in reverse order. So, Ms. Velma, you have the floor. You're muted. Yeah, I mean, I've been talking so much recently that I didn't even have had a chance to think about it. But... I mean, what I would like to send as a final message is that, you know, we all should support young people. We all, we all should share our knowledge and expertise and, and help them to create their own networks, raise their profile, raise their visibility, help them to educate and, and help them and support this incredibly heavy task of building a, a peace building because I know how difficult it is. So. They have a difficult task, but they also need our support and our knowledge and our, our, our expertise. So that's, that, would be, that would be my final. 
Thank you so much. Uh, Bishop Spain. Uh, when I was listening to the question about what's the greatest thing that w could come out of the COVID um, pandemic, I was thinking uh, it's not a culture of peace, it'll be a culture of healing. When we all understand we're all vulnerable and we all need to help the healing of each other. That's what I think this is really about. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Grant. You're muted. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, I would just briefly say that uh, in the era in which we're going into, uh, war has to be off the table, conflict has to be off the table, total cooperation has to be on the table. Uh, we must do whatever we can to strengthen and expand the protections against nuclear weapons. And we must pour most of our treasure today and time into a desperate effort to stop global warming and, uh, or climate change, whichever term you prefer. We have 20, maybe 30 years before it becomes irreversible and we can't save human civilization as we know it. We now have a few decades and we must make the most of it. Thank you so much, Dr. Popovich. Thank you so much. Uh, this is uh, for Pragna and to sum up my, I, I think my comments, the world is not going to concede or accommodate you need to show up in it and voice yourself in the best of way you can do within the conditions in which you find yourself. And for women in particular, uh, the world is not going, the formal structures are not going to just concede and accommodate either. So the best is to build, like uh, Ms. Sharij said, build your own communities, build your own organizations, build alternative realities and initiatives so that what you magnetize by attracting through powerful values the, the humanity's common goals and common aspiration and attending to human needs. That's a daily commitment to oneself. That is a very personal responsibility. That is uh, something that we each should do, show up in the world with the best of what we know and what we can do within certain circumstances to actually demonstrate that in our actions, in our activities, in all of our relations and associations on full scale from the personal to family, to communities, nations, regions, and planetary belonging. That is what we can do to personally transform in order to affect the greater social fabric. So in that sense, I'm happy to be able to show up today. Kek Kashan, thank you for building this uh, space for all of us. Thank you so much, Dr. Zerbo. Thank you. I just want to sum up uh, by asking Kekashan that in uh, uh, 20 years, I want you to invite this young, uh, this little boy who is writing here, Daddy, uh, I think some lawmakers are secretly trying to cut funding to the CTBT. We should stop them. I don't want to live, to grow up in the world of nuclear weapon or nuclear testing. So he said, no nuke, no test. And I guess you will say no pandemics and we have to save our climate as well. So I'll give you his address and then you'll invite him in 20 years to talk and then to be a voice uh, to all of us. Thank you. Absolutely. That is my promise. And Madam Kiragawa, you have the floor. Yes, thank you so much. I want to express my deepest appreciation again for this wonderful opportunity to be together. And if we really want peace and to build back better, we really must honor the equal role of women as important peace builders. And we must cooperate with each other and develop those values and principles that propel us to do the examination of injustices and live our own lives right where we are as the holy ground to be in alignment with our values and ethical principles and implement them daily to become that change we want to see. And in all things, may we be the manifestation of loving thoughts, loving words, and loving actions in all that we do. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I do see we have more raised hands, but to our panelists, we will be uh, taking the questions from our attendees and be sending them to you. 
Uh, but I would just like to say th thank you so much to all of our panelists for your amazing insights and listening to each and every one of you has been an absolute privilege and it has given us as the audience several guiding points on what we as individuals can do to adopt a culture of peace and build back better. And we at Green Hope Foundation strongly believe that every individual has uh, the accountability and the responsibility in this process of building back better. And our individual actions supported by prudent policymaking and cooperation amongst all stakeholders will be critical in raising our planet out of this quagmire. And we have more questions now than solutions in many cases, but one thing is clear, the road forward has to be built on the principles of a culture of peace, solving our problems through dialogue and negotiation amongst individuals, groups, and nations. So thank you once again to all of our panelists. Please stay safe, and we hope that we get to meet all of you in person someday very soon. Thank you once again, and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.